Okay, I would like to introduce all of you beautiful, curious-minded people to my favorite animal in the world. This is the Peter Pan of the amphibian world. It's an axolotl. So it's a type of salamander, but it never fully grows up and climbs out of the water like other salamanders do. And this little guy has X-Man-style powers, right? So if it loses any limb, it can just completely regenerate. It's amazing. And I mean, look at it. It's got a face with a permanent smile. It's <laughs> framed by feathery gills. It's just, uh, how could you not love that? This particular type of axolotl, a very close relative, is known as an achoke. It is equally as cute. Um, and it lives in just one place in a, a lake in the north of Mexico. It's called Lake Patsguro, and, and as you can see, it is stunningly beautiful. But unfortunately, it's been so overfished and so badly polluted that the achoke is dying out altogether. And this is something that's a scenario that's playing out all over the world. We're living through an extinction crisis. And species are particularly vulnerable when they're evolutionarily tailored to just one little niche or maybe one lake. But this is TED, right? So this is where I give you the big idea, the big solution. So how do you save one special weird species from going extinct? Well, the answer, at least my answer, isn't a grand technological intervention. It's actually really simple. It's that you find people who know all about this animal, and you ask them, and you listen to them. And you work with them if they're up for that. So I want to tell you about how I've seen that in science, and in conservation in particular, if scientists don't team up with local people who have really valuable knowledge, but a practical wisdom that's not going to be published in any academic journal, they can really miss the point. Scientists and science as an enterprise can fall at the first hurdle if it rushes in knowing that it's the experts that know best. But when scientists shake off those academic constraints and really look to people who have a totally different but really important perspective on what they're trying to do, it can genuinely save the world, one wonderfully weird amphibian at a time. So in the case of the Achoke, these are the people you need on your team. <laughs> these are the Sisters of the Immaculate Health. They are nuns who have a convent in Patsguro, they live in Patsguro, and they have a shared history with the Achoke, and it is so mind-bogglingly wonderful that it drew me all the way there to make an audio documentary about them. And I even have the unflattering selfie to prove it. <laughs> so there is a room at the center of their convent, though, that looks like this. It's very strange. It's lined with all these tanks full of fresh water and hundreds of Achokes. And that's because this creature, because of its, of its regenerative abilities, it's believed has healing powers if you consume it. So the sisters actually make and sell a medicine using a chokes. I bought a bottle of it. <laughs> so it's, this is it. It tastes a bit like honey. Um, but the sisters reckon it is good for all kinds of particularly respiratory ailments. So I just want you to have a listen, if you will, to a clip of Sister Ophelia. Our convent was founded by Dominican nuns here in Pátzcuaro in 1747. Sometime after that, our sisters started to make the achoke syrup. We didn't discover the properties of the achoke. That was the original people from around here since ancient times. But we then started to make the syrup too. The locals knew that, and they came to offer us the animals. I see. So the achokes are part of, of making that syrup. What, what does the syrup treat? What is it for? It's good for coughs, asthma, bronchitis, uh, the lungs, and back pain. And so you've harnessed that power in a syrup, in a, in a medicine. Can you tell me how it's made? You're shaking your head and smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not up for sharing the centuries-old secret recipe. <laughs> but but um, this, 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 the achoke, the, the decline in the achoke, actually nearly put a halt to that medicine production altogether, which is why the sisters started this. It's the world's first achoke farm. So all they wanted was a healthy, sustainable population so that they could continue to make that medicine. But what they created at the same time was a captive breeding program for a critically endangered species. And fast forward a few years, and these scientists that you can see in this picture from Chester Zoo all the, all the way over in the UK, not far from where I live, 
and from Michoacana University in Morelia in Mexico, have persuaded the sisters, took years of careful diplomacy, to join them in a research partnership. So the nuns show the biologists how you rear perfectly healthy, very robust Patsquaro achokes, and the scientists have put some of their funding into tax filters and pumps in this strange, incongruous but amazing room. This is the kind of partnership that can save a species. But I don't think I see enough of this sort of thing, and I have been ludicrously lucky in my job. I've travelled. To loads of places and just basically followed around brilliant people who are trying to use science to answer big questions and solve problems. So I've hung out with scientists who've solved the mystery of the origin of the menopause by tracking killer whales off the North Pacific coast, and I've followed around scientists who've planted cameras in Antarctic penguin colonies because they were looking to capture the impacts of climate change as it happens. But it's this team that really stuck with me. That really showed me the impact that these delicate but really important relationships can have. And I think the reason that it stuck with me as well is because it's not common. And one of the reasons it's not common is because our traditional approach of the hierarchical system of academic achievement doesn't exactly encourage the type of humility where scientists will look to non-scientists and really ask for their input. In fact, I think we have a bit of a Tradition, especially in the West, of a kind of academically blinkered hubris that has kept science historically an enterprise for the elite. And I think, although that's moved on, it continues to be its downfall on occasion. So, here's my example from history and my takedown of a scientific hero. So, Ernest Shackleton and his Transantarctic expedition more than a century ago, the celebrated ill-fated adventure. On his way there, Shackleton just didn't listen to the whalers in South Georgia. They knew that region, and they told him, "You won't get through the ice this year. It's too widespread. It's too far north. It's too dangerous." And look what happened. I mean, granted, that great adventure, that story of heroic leadership that we still tell, where he saved every single one of his men. We wouldn't be telling that story if he just hightailed it for home and taken their advice. But it cost him his ship. I would imagine quite a lot of cold injuries among the team, a good few cases of PTSD, and Mrs. Chippy, the ship's cat, had to be shot because the team couldn't afford any extra food as they fought to survive. <laughs> Now, that was all a very long time ago. But as I've prepared for this talk, I've revisited some of the stories that I have covered, where these really unusual collaborations made a real positive difference. So I spoke to former poachers whose knowledge of where they used to hunt illegally is now really important in conservation projects in those same places, and I spoke to an amazing artist whose own experience of mental health struggles has actually paved the way for him to take a role in designing and creating a new, really innovative and beautiful mental health ward in a hospital. Most recently, I worked here in the Chernobyl exclusion zone with a team of scientists that have been working there for decades. One of their experiments, growing crops in that area, has now turned into this. It's Chernobyl's first vodka. <laughs> It's pretty good too. I've tasted it.、Um, And this is actually, although it looks like a niche product, it's actually it's going to be, or it's set to be, the first consumer product to come out of the exclusion zone since the nuclear accident. And that's actually the result of years of conversation with local communities who still live on the periphery of that abandoned land and want to know when they can and if they can safely grow food and build businesses and rebuild their communities and their lives. This was a product of humility. Of listening, and I saw that in spades when I visited Patsquaro. So I watched as a decades-experienced conservation biologist called Gerardo Garcia listened and watched super carefully as a nun in a full habit and wimple and latex gloves showed him how if you tap an achoke on the head really gently, it'll open its mouth so you can quickly get a DNA swab with a Q-tip. <laughs> when scientists team up with, look to, and defer. To people who have a really valuable perspective on what they're trying to do, but a totally different outlook, something really special can happen. Now, there is a 
a truly global and a very, very ambitious example of this called the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Now, that is not a snappy title, but stick with me. This organization includes more than 130 countries, and it's aiming to do nothing less than assess the state of the natural world across our entire planet. So it recently published this global assessment on the state of nature, and that could be the foundation for an international agreement where all of those nations could sign up to finally take action to tackle the biodiversity crisis that's happening on planet Earth right now. Now, I know from trying to communicate, trying to report on reports like this, on assessments like this for a broad audience, that these big international groups can seem so high level as to be kind of out of reach and nebulous. But there's a group of human beings at the center of them, the report's authors, who have this formidable task of bringing together all of that biological and ecological information that paints a clear and accurate picture of the state of the natural world. And 10 years before this panel even set out to do that, to put that assessment together, they created what's called a cultural concept framework. So this is essentially a cultural concept translation dictionary, right, for all of the different ways that we talk about the natural world. So it formally recognizes, for example, that Mother Earth and nature means the same thing. And what that means is that indigenous and local knowledge can be brought into the same document and given the weight and merit that it deserves, in that assessment of what our natural environment, what state our natural environment is in. And that is absolutely critical because, you know, an Inuit hunter might never publish in an academic journal, but I'll bet you she knows more about the changes to her home Arctic community because of climate change than a scientist who spent many years going to and from that region taking measurements. And collectively, Indigenous people are the caretakers of an estimated 25% of the entire global land surface, including some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. So imagine how much we're missing if we don't cross those cultural boundaries, or at least try to, when we're trying to figure out how the world works and how to protect it. Every single research proposal is a new opportunity to do exactly that. So what if every time a research project was proposed, it had to include a suggestion of a person or a group of people, local farmers, indigenous community leaders, nuns, that researchers wanted to bring into the fold, invite into their team and listen to. I just want to let Sister Ophelia give her view of why she's so particularly driven and dedicated to the survival of the Achoke. Sister Ophelia, do you think that saving this species from extinction, is that part of your work for God? It's the responsibility of every human being not to harm those who live around us. That's all living things. We're all created not only just to survive, but to be happy and to make others happy. All of us here are providing happiness by protecting this animal, and we're also making him happy. I feel like I should sort of slink off and let the nuns sing me out, because it sounds, it sounds so lovely. But did you hear that? We're providing happiness. Now, that's not a protocol you'd ever see outlined in any formal research project proposal. <laughs> But it's the impetus behind what's become the most successful breeding program in the world of an animal that was on the very brink of being wiped out. And isn't that just wonderful? Thank you.